their family was so beautiful. Everything was picture perfect, but I guess it wasn't. They seemed like they were my children. And I was proud of them. And that's how I felt about them. In March 2022, Eric Eugene passed away. Unexpectedly, at the age of 39, he left behind a devoted wife, Corey, and their three sons. A year later, Corey is still struggling to cope with the loss of her husband. She even developed a children's book to help her children, and maybe kids in similar situations, grieve and mourn the passing of a family member. You might think you know how this is going, but this narrative is about to take a stunning turn. Just a few weeks later, Corey herself would become the primary suspect in her husband's murder. Surely there is much more to this story than meets the eye. Join us as we dive into the twisted case of Corey Richens, the woman who killed her husband and wrote a book about it. The story begins in Camas, a city in southwestern Summit County, Utah, where the Richens family lived. They lived happily in their five-bedroom home on Willow Court, which is reportedly valued at more than $1.1 million. Eric Eugene Richens was born in May 1982 to one of the oldest and most prominent families in Summit County. Eric had a happy childhood. He spent most of his time outdoors, either helping his father on their ranch or playing sports like soccer, baseball, and basketball in his spare time. This also manifested in his later life as a father, because he never missed an opportunity to coach his son's teams and go on avid hunting trips. Eric was a devoted Christian and even spent two years on a mission in Mexico City. Eric was skilled with his hands, so by leveraging this along with a determination to succeed, Eric established a thriving masonry business from scratch known as C&E Stone Masonry. He was a good man, and so was his wife, or so everyone thought. Just like Eric, Corey had also hailed from Utah. She was born in Heber City in April 1990. According to her LinkedIn profile, she holds a bachelor's degree in healthcare administration from Weber State University and also holds a master's in human resources from Utah State University. Sometime in 2010, she started a housekeeping company named Corey Darden Housekeeping Services. She also worked in the healthcare sector for a while, but most recently, she became active in the real estate industry as a licensed agent. Eric and Corey met when Corey was working as a cashier at Home Depot, where Corey was earning her living as a cashier. They bonded quickly over a shared love of sports and their ambitious spirits. A few years after they met, the two eventually tied the knot on the 15th of June 2013. This was not the first time Eric was getting married. He had already been through one messy divorce, which is probably why his mother handed Corey a prenuptial agreement on the wedding day. One of the assertions of this prenup is that Corey would not have a claim to Eric's 50% stake in his masonry business unless Eric died during their marriage. With hindsight, you can see that Eric unknowingly signed his own death warrant in trying to protect his assets. In the following years, Eric and Corey welcomed three boys, now age 10, 9, and 6. Everybody that knew them loved the Richens family. Their community described them as warm, sociable, and kind. Eric was obviously the primary provider, while Curry mostly worried about one big plan after the other. Unfortunately, financial strains would seep in and pick apart this idyllic marriage. Some court documents prove that Corey obtained four separate life insurance policies on Eric without his knowledge between 2015 and 2017. These insurance policies had a combined potential payout of $2 million. By September 2020, Eric discovered that Corey had somehow obtained and spent a $250,000 home equity line of credit on their Camas home without his knowledge. That was not all. Eric also found that she had withdrawn at least $100,000 from his bank accounts and racked up more than $30,000 in charges on his credit cards. Additionally, Corey misappropriated over $100,000 from Eric's business funds set aside for tax payments. As you can imagine, this was a lot for Eric to take. All of a sudden, he saw Corey differently as a woman he could no longer trust. When confronted about the stolen money, Corey only said that she planned to reimburse him. The following month, Eric reached out to divorce and estate planning attorneys for advice. By November, Eric set in motion a new asset protection strategy, which appointed his sister, Katie Richens Benson, as trustee and excluded Curry from assigning his estate to a living trust without her knowledge. In addition, these aggressive moves were seemingly designed to protect the children's financial futures. Eric's family has said that around this time, Eric grew more suspicious of Curry. Sometime in 2020, he and Curry had taken a romantic trip to Greece. 
But one night, while on their vacation, Eric called his sister Amy Richens and told her Curry had tried to poison him. Corey had fixed him a drink, and after he took it, he became very ill. This does not seem like the first thing that will come to mind after drinking something your spouse made for you. So clearly their marriage was heading for the rocks. Maybe Curry had already been exhibiting some other strange behaviours aside from the theft that he may have picked up on. But whatever reason, Eric was now alarmed. They returned from vacation and went back to their normal, seemingly happy everyday lives. Eric knew something was wrong, but was not in a hurry to do something about it. He believed he had taken sufficient precautionary measures and was doing what was best for his kids as a devoted father. The next two years were good for the Richins family. Well, that is if you were looking from the outside. But by 2022, everything would blow up in their faces. Eric started to see reasons to be worried again. It all started when Curry spotted a large mansion known as the Grand House for sale in the nearby city of Midway. Finished. The concept video of the house did up by Rosewood Homes shows the entire vision for the 20,000 square foot estate, complete with a basketball court, swimming pool, and home theater, golf simulator, and rock wall. I spoke with Utah realtor Brian Kelly to get an insider's look on how all this controversy might affect the future. Curry desperately wanted to purchase the home because she believed she could flip it for an insane profit. Eric felt like the $2 million mansion was not only too expensive, but also too much of a risk. As you can imagine, this caused a rift between the two again. That same year, Eric's business partner and co-founder of C&E Masonry, Cody Wright, got a notification from their insurance company informing him that Curry had signed into their account and made herself the sole beneficiary on Eric's policy. Cody told Eric about the change and they were able to switch it back to the original terms. Adjusting a spouse's life insurance policy is a big and bright red flag. But in this case, Eric chose not to confront Curry about any of this. Instead, he resolved to get a divorce and work out a way to do it peacefully for his children's benefit. Meanwhile, Curry was making plans of her own. She had acquired about 15 to 30 pills of fentanyl and made a sinister plan for Valentine's Day. That February 14th in 2022, Curry prepared dinner for her and Eric to eat together and also fixed him a sandwich afterward. Eric later told Cody that he felt very ill that night. He broke out into hives and even felt breathless. At this point, Eric told his sisters that if anything ever happened to him, Curry was to blame. On one hand, Eric must have been shielding his sons from a messy divorce, and on the other, we imagine that it must have been hard to mentally accept that his wife was actively trying to kill him. Two weeks later, Curry acquired another batch of drugs for her next attempt on Eric's life. Meanwhile, Eric thought that he was keeping Curry at bay by making her believe he would purchase the grand house. He had told his family that he would shock Curry with the news in due time, but unfortunately, Eric would be declared dead in a couple of days. The police arrive at Richin's home in the early hours of March 4th. Curry reported that she and Eric had been celebrating together on the night of March 3rd for closing on a big estate. But the truth is that at around 9 p.m., she went to the kitchen and made him a Moscow mule, a cocktail that would be Eric's last. Going back to her testimony, Curry had said they both went to bed, but then one of their sons had woken up from a night terror, and like any good mother would, she went to lay with him in his bed till he slept again. She said she also slept off until around 3 a.m. when she woke up and returned to her room. Getting there, she met Eric lying still and cold to the touch. She called 911 and told the operator that she had been attempting CPR. The paramedics arrived and reported that Eric was on the floor near to the foot of the bed. Their initial reports also debunked Curry's claims of attempting CPR on Eric. Apparently, Eric had blood coming from his mouth and there did not seem to be any blood on Curry. After all possible life-saving measures were attempted, Eric was pronounced dead. Due to his age, Eric's death was deemed suspicious and an investigation kicked off. It was discovered that there was five times the fatal amount of street fentanyl in Eric's system. Curry was asked if Eric had an issue with drugs and she reported that he had struggled with an addiction for pain medication in high school, but she was unaware of any recent drug use. His family refuted this claim and stood on their conviction based on all Eric had told them. The day after Eric died, Curry had gathered some people at their home and was reportedly drinking and celebrating that they had finally closed on the grand house. 
This is a woman who had just lost her husband. Rather than grieving, she was busy celebrating. Eric's sister Katie was apparently at the gathering and had a fight with Curry because of it. At some point during this altercation, Katie finally told Curry that Eric had replaced her as his beneficiary. Curry reportedly lost it and physically assaulted Katie in anger. Curry had no intention of accepting defeat. She filed a claim against her husband and his sister with reports that Eric had defrauded her, as he had no right to transfer her shares of his assets, as outlined in the prenup, without her knowledge. Not only was she suing for the claims to Eric's estate, she was also suing his sister Katie for an additional $300,000. By June 2022, Katie countersued Curry and cited the investigation into the suspicious circumstances of her brother's death. Notably, Eric's family decided to remain quiet during this crucial time of the police investigation because they did not want to do anything that could affect getting justice for Eric. So Eric's family had their plans, but Curry also had hers. During this time, she made conscious steps to come off as an innocent and grieving wife. At some point during the investigation, the authorities asked to download the contents of Curry's phone. This would shed some much needed light on the murder case. Going back to that night of his death, Curry had told investigators that she had left her phone plugged in at their bedside. This meant that she did not have her phone on her when she went into the other room to help their son go back to sleep. This did not seem like anything at the time, but now her phone records told a different and more incriminating story. Apparently, there was quite a significant level of activity on her phone within that time period that night. The records show a movement of her phone, a conversation with someone, and a deleted text message within the time that she claimed to have been sleeping next to her son. Deleted text messages have since been recovered that prove Curry communicated with a dealer and had purchased the exact kind of drugs that had killed her husband. This dealer goes by the alias CL and has been interviewed by the police. CL admitted to selling these substances to Curry, so he may likely have worked out an immunity deal. There are currently no articles or documents to prove this, but it is very likely. While this investigation was ongoing, Curry kept up with her grieving widow act, pretending to be as distraught as her three grieving sons. Eric was such a good father to his boys, he was a huge part of their lives, so we can't imagine how lost they felt without their father. As disturbing as the thought of Curry pretending to grieve with her son seemed, this was not the worst thing she had done. Curry went on to exploit her son's grief and make money from the situation. What did Curry do? She wrote a book titled Are You With Me? This book capitalizes on children's sadness and confusion after the loss of a parent and is meant to guide them towards acceptance in a healthy way. Me dedicated to my amazing husband and a wonderful father. Are you in the clouds when I look up to see you, to tell you about my day, ask about yours, and tell you that I love you? Are you at my soccer game when I scored that goal for you? I looked for you in the crowd, but you weren't there. Did you see it? Are you with me on my birthday to blow out my candles, to celebrate another year and watch me grow, teach me new things, and watch me make mistakes? The book goes on and on like that. It really is a heartfelt book. It was published on the 7th of March 2023, and Curry actually went on media outlets to promote the book, one of which is the now famous interview she had with Good Things Utah. So you actually wrote this book with your children. I did. Mm -hmm. And it's only been a year. How did you process and say you th go from processing death to I need to write a book and help others? You know, I just watched the struggle that my kids were going through. And I actually, you know, I went on Amazon and Barnes and Noble and trying to find something that we could use to cope at nights. Nights are the hardest, it seems like, for everybody when, you know, dealing with anything. But I just wanted some story to read to my kids at night. And I just could not find anything. I couldn't find anything that really, you know, suited them or helped them find comfort and peace. And so, you know, I was like, let's just write one. During this interview, Curry spoke about her book and emphasized the three C's that she came up with to help her children cope with the loss. The first being connection, then continuity and care. One thing we find odd about this interview is her utter lack of emotion and choice of clothing. She wore a jacket, and not just any jacket, it was an outwear jacket as opposed to a suit or trendy jacket. Not to mention the dull brown color. Curry must have been trying to dress herself down or to come off a certain kind of way, a grieving wife who couldn't care less about how she looked. We also find her said reason for writing this book to be very false. Curry told the news outlet that she had looked for books to read to her children for comfort in these hard days, 
but was unable to find any. This would be a good reason to write a book, except for the fact that there are plenty of children's books about grief and bereavement, so it is possible that Curry simply saw an opportunity to make some more money. She was not as rich as she had thought she would be if Eric died. Curry's book did very well. It quickly made its way to the top of the charts on Amazon and Barnes & Noble. She was making money and getting attention, but just when Curry thought she was getting everything she wanted, it all imploded a month later. Curry Richens was finally arrested for the murder of her husband, Eric Richens, on the 8th of May. Since then, the Richens' children, Carter, Ashton, and Weston, have been in the custody of Eric's sister, who continues to look after them as their legal guardian. Curry's 41-page book, Are You With Me?, is no longer available on Amazon. The Utah News Channel that conducted the TV interview later updated its story to publicly state that it had not been aware Curry was a suspect in her husband's death. Interesting, because we have so many people who sit right here, Nisha, every day, and we don't necessarily know their background or what's happening in the last few years of their lives. And so this is Corey Richens. She came on the show. She wrote in to the station saying, I have a book that could help grieving children who may have suffered a loss. So we brought her on, and she talked about her, her, her husband who passed away and all she said was he died suddenly, unexpectedly, and it was a shock. The hosts who interviewed Curry that day admitted having a private discussion with Curry after the interview. Curry had told them off camera that Eric got COVID and eventually died of a lung complication. They also spoke about their perception of Curry in the short time they spent with her that day. One of the hosts pointed out that she did not particularly pick up any negative vibes from Curry but she found the way she seemingly grieved her husband's loss a bit odd. When you look back after the fact, you're like, huh, well, I wonder if that was interesting. And she didn't show emotion, right? We have so many people who grieve in different ways, they process differently, and who are we to say that's the wrong way to process, right? SDI'd, some people come in a little more prepared for it and they can power through and be composed. I did clock that, that she wasn't necessarily emotional, but I, again, I thought, okay, well, it's been a year. Maybe she's just prepared to speak about it. And I did think that it was an interesting uh, choice, what she wore on the air. She was all bundled up in her jacket. Her hair wasn't quite brushed. And I thought, she's still going through it. She's grieving. She's not quite together. So it's expressing it in maybe that way. She's not quite pulled together. Curry appeared in court on the 12th of June for her bail hearing. During the hearing, a lot of circumstantial and direct evidence came to light. And as a result of these revelations, Curry was denied bail. At this point, we could not help but ponder on a few things. Why did it take a full year before charges were finally brought against Curry Richens? Will the direct evidence be strong enough to result in a conviction? How much of the circumstantial evidence can be actually proven? And of course, what could Curry's defense possibly be? Eric Richens truly seemed like an amazing person who loved his family and did everything he could to bring happiness to those around him. It is heartbreaking what has happened to the Richens family. As for Curry, we did not understand how people still think they can do things like this and get away with it. Nothing is really private anymore, as in this day and age, everything on your phone is saved. She probably did not know this, but still we think it was selfish and unnecessary for her to risk it all and cause so much hurt to her children. As the case progresses, we believe we will get these answers and maybe have some more insights into Curry's motives for murder. And above all, we hope that justice will be served in due time.